CRISPR. That stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. From humble beginnings, this system has revolutionised the way we do genetic engineering, providing scientists with levels of accuracy, precision and speed that they've never had before. CRISPR is an adaptive immunity phenomenon found in bacteria, where cells integrate DNA sequences of past pathogens into their genomes at CRISPR loci, allowing them to recognise the pathogen. CAS proteins, guided by RNA transcribed from the CRISPR DNA, then find and cleave the pathogen in subsequent infections. Scientists have engineered this system for genome editing purposes, and the Cas9 protein system can be used in essentially any organism. By providing Cas9 with a guide RNA strand complementary to a gene of interest, researchers can induce double standard breaks at exact points in an organism's genome. Next, they provide the cell with a DNA template to use as it repairs the defect. It takes a bit of luck and doesn't always work, but sometimes the cell will use the template to replace the excised DNA in a process called homology-directed repair. Thus, researchers can introduce precise DNA sequence modifications into the genomes they're studying. In 2015, a Chinese research team became the first group to use CRISPR to modify a human embryo, and further studies have occurred in the USA. However, a plethora of concerns has subsequently been raised by the scientific community, particularly regarding our lack of understanding of potential side effects. Indeed, Recent research demonstrates that we still have a lot to learn. A 2016 study by Ma et al. in America used CRISPR-Cas9 to attempt to correct a paternal mutation in human embryos. Their approach was to inject oocytes with donor sperm from a heterozygous mutant carrier, together with Cas9 complexes to direct the cleavage of the mutant paternal allele. They also injected a synthetic DNA template for the gene of interest to facilitate homology-directed repair. This template contained two single nucleotide polymorphisms for identification purposes. Surprisingly, when analysing their PCR results, the researchers found that their results showed 72% of the embryos had a wild-type copy of the gene of interest, instead of the template DNA as expected. They argue that this is due to the cell using the wild-type maternal allele to correct the break in the paternal chromosome, instead of the repair template. This process is known as interhomolog homologous recombination. However, this explanation has been disputed by several research groups worldwide. Professor Paul Thomas, head of the Genome Editing Laboratory at SAMRI, points out that it's just highly unlikely. The chances that the cell repair process would select the single maternal chromosome over the millions of copies of template DNA are very slim. A more concerning alternative hypothesis involves Cas9-mediated off-target deletions. The theory is that the PCR primer binding sites immediately upstream and downstream of the mutant paternal allele are deleted preventing the amplification of the paternal chromosome. This would mean that when the researchers performed PCR amplification, only the wild type maternal allele could be amplified. This would give the misleading appearance that the paternal allele had been repaired using the wild type maternal allele as a template, but really it had not been amplified at all. With this possibility in mind, Paul's team performed experiments to evaluate the hypothesis. They used CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce mutations in mouse embryos and then used PCR to amplify the products. They found that about 17% of their successfully mutated samples generated much smaller PCR products than expected, indicating a deletion had occurred, and several samples failed to amplify altogether. Next, they screened specifically for large deletions, performing PCR amplification using primers located further upstream and downstream of the gene of interest. Not only were the PCR products again much smaller than expected, but several products were generated that were not observed in the first PCR. To Paul and his team, this demonstrated that the original primers had been inadvertently deleted by Cas9, as they suspected. This was enough to convince them that the authors of the original study could not be sure of their findings, and they published their research in Nature Journal, calling for further investigations into the problem. So, we now know that using CRISPR to edit embryos appears to have some serious technical limitations that we don't yet fully appreciate. There are also ethical implications to consider. Editing human embryos is not something we should do lightly, and for that reason, it's not legal in most countries, including Australia. We've just seen how easy it is for the editing process to go wrong, and that's dangerous, because editing the embryo means editing every cell in the human it gives rise to. For his part, Paul is not convinced that editing embryos is necessary. Even if they got this working and it was 100% correct, do we need to do it? That's the other thing putting all the ethical questions to one side, at a technical level, is it a good idea? Paul points out that the primary application of this technology would be to generate disease-free embryos for IVF. However, he notes that we already have an efficient and easy way of screening for healthy or diseased embryos, so he questions the need for this technology. 
For Paul, the exciting future for CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing lies instead in its potential to develop disease therapeutics by correcting errors in somatic cells. He believes this has applications in conditions such as muscular dystrophy, where the correction will be limited to affected muscle cells, aiming to restore their function. Even with this seemingly safer application of CRISPR-Cas9, there are still risks. For example, a recent study identified that individuals can have a T-cell-mediated immune response against a Cas9 protein. It's obvious that CRISPR isn't going anywhere anytime soon, and it will surely continue to shape the evolution of genome engineering. But as scientists, we have a responsibility to ensure we understand the risks and pitfalls of CRISPR technology, and, like Paul and his team, make the best decisions we can about how to proceed. As Paul says, time will tell the rest of the CRISPR story. Thank you.